Peter's letter to uh, various churches in various regions, he, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You know, they're, they're, all, they're all facing death and they're all dying and they're all seeing each other die and they're all living this culture of death and death is all around them and all they have to look forward to is death and then if they don't die, they're going to die soon and if not, they're going to watch people they love die today, tomorrow, and the next day. This is what their future looked like and, and, and Peter had quite a death experience. He watched Jesus die. And he saw Jesus come back, but he saw Jesus leave again. And people don't realize that that was not a happy day for the apostles to see Jesus leave and, and ascend to heaven. It was a sad day. There was nothing but sad. I mean, yeah, they were happy that he was dead and they got what had happened, sort of. But they still lost their Jesus. They still, still lost him. And Jesus was the representation of the ultimate Christian. I'm dead, but I'm not dead. I'm not with you, but I'm always with you. I'm with, I'm with the Father, and we're with you always. Well, when you lose someone you love, and they're not with you anymore, who gives a flying Twinkie and a rolling donut if they're in heaven having a party? Now, if one more person tries to comfort me with that, I'm going to comfort them with my boot. It's just outrageous. It's just I have to say, and nobody's experienced this who, and, and would say that to anyone. No one would. No one in their right mind would say that. No one would. And the reason they wouldn't is because it's apples and oranges. And anyone who's known me for five minutes knows that I understand where my son is. And we all get that. Has nothing to do with my experience. Nothing. I have one box checked. One comfort box is checked. And that's it. And it's a big one. I, I can't even imagine what hopelessness of eternal resting place would feel like on top of everything else in all this. To be honest, I think that the depths of the madness and pain and confusion of this experience, I don't know if anything could make it feel any worse. I don't know. I wouldn't want to find out, though. So I'll just say I'm grateful to God that my son loved the Lord, but please understand that the people who hung out with Jesus were devastated when he went back to the Father. Devastated. They did not have a party. They did not not mourn him. His mama was sad. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the, that the genuous, genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, yeah, you have resurrection to look forward to and being reunited with Jesus and the fellow saints to look forward to. But right now, you're in various trials, which is an understatement. It's an understatement. These people were watching their children get killed. I, uh, I, know I never recommend Holocaust movies or anything, but if you ever really want a, a, a sense of tremendous loss at the hand of another person, see Sophie's Choice and try to survive the last half hour of that movie and still be the same person you were when you started watching it. Unbearable. Unbearable. And this was a lifestyle for, the, for God's persecuted people all along. And we think because it was a lifestyle that they somehow got used to watching their parents and brothers and sisters and kids getting killed 
by um, the Egyptians, the Romans, the Nazis. Heartless, heartless. We don't want to feel anything, but we have to in order to feel what the Father felt being separated from Christ. No one ever thinks about what it was like in heaven when Jesus went to earth. What effect that had had where he came from. Um, gospel singer Leslie Phillips wrote um, a beautiful song on her, that was on her first record called Will They Love Him? And it was a song from an angel's perspective that Jesus was going to leave heaven and go to earth. And the opening line of the song says, what's in the Father's mind? What's he thinking? What's God thinking here? Do you have any idea? We have been t caring for him for all eternity. And now he's going to go there and will they love him? Will they take care of him like we do? Will they, will they worship him? Will they, will they recognize who he is like we do? We know the answer is absolutely not. They're going to kill him. And what anguish that was for God, the Father, and what anguish that was for all the angels in heaven. We are so selfish that we actually don't think about this. We don't. We just say, this is the system, and that's between God and Jesus, and that doesn't affect us. But it does affect us because we partake in his sufferings. We partake in his sufferings. I have lost my only son. Try not to make a parallel there. Try not to make a parallel between how many times in Scripture the, the firstborn sons are slaughtered. Try not to make a parallel of that in, in my life if you're me. Try not to think about it. Try not to make a parallel of every bad thing you can think of. Try. Try. God bless you. I wouldn't wish this on anyone. But all the apostles experienced it. All the, all the people in Auschwitz experienced it. All God experienced it. Everyone experiences it sooner or later to some degree, somehow, some way. And either way, whether they do or they don't, we are called to partake in Christ's suffering and the suffering of others. And I'm not asking anyone to join my pity party. It's a party of one. I don't like hugs. I don't like calls. I don't like attention. I don't like any of it. And yet, if I don't get it, I bitch about it to my friends that nobody ever does it. There's no winning with me. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't, I don't know. Plant a tree in Israel in my son's honor, and I'll think that was cool. We split the difference. Some attention, but it doesn't actually touch me. Don't really plant a tree in Israel, by the way. <laughs> I think that costs 100 bucks. Don't need 100 bucks to my ministry to help me put the show up faster. Hello? Don't waste money in Israel. I don't even know if it even gets it. I mean, it's like buying a star or a planet. Do you really know you ever really get that? I don't think so. I, I got so many trees planted in my honor in, in Israel for my bar mitzvah. I just wanted the money, guys. I'm 13. I just want the money. <laughs> By the way, I bought that piano for my, with my bar mitzvah money. That's what I did with my bar mitzvah money. Good investment? Pretty cool, huh? Even I look back and think that guy was pretty cool because I could have done anything with it and that's what I wanted. I could have gotten a grand piano for people who hadn't bought damn trees. <laughs> And the glory of the, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, who having not seen you love. He, he finishes that thought of you have the, the trust and the hope and the, the comfort of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, whom you love without seeing. And, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I just saw the wonky Jesus movie that's out right now. And... It had my favorite part of the New Testament in it where Jesus says, you, you, believe, you believe because you see, blessed are those who believe without seeing. And he's talking about future generations of believers who will believe in Jesus without ever seeing him in the flesh. And Peter's already recognizing that in, this, in, these, in these fellow brethren. And... and and he, and he makes a nod to it. He's saying, you know, that you know that you love Jesus, even though you haven't seen him. And and I think it's really thoughtful because Peter has seen him and denied him. And these people haven't seen him and they've accepted him. 
And for the record, I've never denied him in 32 years, not once. Hell no. I'm scared of him. For, you know, for the record, if I wasn't scared of him before, once you have kids, I was scared that he wouldn't protect them. And there was a little bit of a dialogue between me and him when my son died. So I, excuse me. There are a lot of worse people on the planet that run around using your name, and their children are fine. I, you know, we have talks. Don't ask Jesus questions unless you really want to hear the answers, is all I can say, is I'm going to take to my grave things no one should know. But I will say this. There's no point in denying him. There's no point in arguing with him. There's no point in staying mad at him. It's okay to get mad at him. You're in a relationship. But there's no point in staying mad at him. And there's certainly no point in inhibiting anyone else getting close to him, even if it takes something away from you. I said from the day my children were born that they may become uber-Christians and hate me because I'm different. They may hate me. And if it came down to it, I'd rather them love Jesus than love me. And I mean that from the bottom of my little black heart. Knowing my kids know the Lord is everything to me. And, and uh, hello, <laughs> now I know why. Now I know why. Now I know what the difference is. You know? It's kind of irrelevant what kind of relationship I had with my son. I'd, also, I'd say we were very close, close enough to beat the crap out of each other constantly. And, but it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. We were like a two-headed monster, you know? Conjoined. You know what I'm saying? But it doesn't really matter, does it? Only one relationship matters. Only one. And not the one with me, believe it or not. My ego is so big, it's not that big. I stood over my son's dead body and I knew everything about everything. That's all I can say is everything. Man, I just know the difference between what's on the matters list and what's on the doesn't matter list. And all I can say is, is that the most important thing in this life is salvation. Nothing else matters. Nothing. Nothing. And if you don't care, you don't care. And that's between you and God. But whew, you have people that love you and boy, are they going to care. Because I will tell you, every single human being Okay, 99% of all the human beings I'm in any level of contact with anywhere in the world, in person, by phone, by text, by email, by Facebook, 99%, because I can think of one person off the top of my head who may not have said anything to me like this. They're in this room, I think. Maybe. So maybe two people, maybe three, I don't know. But everyone else has told me how it is with my son. They've all told me how it is with my son. He's in a better place. Are you sure? How do you know that? How do you know he's in a better place? I know him better than anybody. How do you know he's in a better place? And how the hell are you going to comfort me with that? Because either he is, and then it's like a duh moment, or he isn't then you're just really rubbing my nose in something. Let's be fair. And he is in a better place, by the way. But I'm just saying, we're, you know, but then it's like, he's an angel, and uh, God needed him for some great purpose. Yeah, to change his tires, you know? It's like, oh yeah, of course. Yeah, because God doesn't have enough help in heaven. He needed to destroy my life to get, what, an errand done? You know, he's the best one to deliver the singing telegram to our Archangel Michael on his eight millionth birthday. I mean, you know, it's, it's everyone has said so many things regarding it. I'm like, you guys know so much. You know why everyone says anything? If I walk up to you and I poke you in the ribs, you're going to go, ah, what are you doing? You're going to react. You're not going to say nothing if you don't see it coming, right? Well, you, no one saw this coming. And everybody reacts, and it, something comes out. Blah. You know what comes out? What you think about happens when we die and where we go. That's what comes out from everybody. 
everybody's philosophies of the afterlife comes out. That's the truth. Everybody's, except one or two people who have withheld comment from me. And life ain't over yet, is it? But everybody got an opinion. I've been in the ministry for 32 years, and for 32 years, here's what I've seen. Hi, my name is so-and-so. Hi, my name is Paisley. What kind of works do you do? I do da-da-da. What do you do? I'm a minister. Well, I went to church when I was da 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 Hit him in the ribs with the, I'm a minister, and blit, blit, comes right out like a belch. Jerry's laughing because he's seen how many times this happened. With his own, just like, blit, this comes right out. I see you're nodding because you tell people you're a Christian. You put it front and center. Tell them you're a Christian. Blit, blit. You know, well, tell them, you know, they find out your kid's dead, but it comes right out. And you, you know what? Out of the mouth, the abundance of the heart belches. It says that right in my Bible. It comes right out like gas. You know, and you hit him in the, hit him in the gut, and out it comes. You know, and, and you know, same with me. I hear the stuff that flies out of my mouth, and I tell people, I have a little black heart that could be you could easily benefit from being a few sizes larger at Christmas time, you know, I get it. I'm not, I'm not judging, I'm just a, a pointing out the obvious. And that is, people are scared shitless about dying. And from what I've seen of it, it looks pretty bad. People who aren't, I think are really freaky scary. Just, just so you know, I judge people who, who aren't scared of dying. That's, that's on me, right? That's not on them, it's on me. But if you spend five minutes with them and talk about the dying process, then you can scare them a little bit. It's like people who aren't afraid of flying. Go on an airplane with me. You'll be afraid. You'll be afraid. Five minutes on an airplane with Paisley, and you will take a train. Yep. Yeah. No. no. But people are unsure about the unknown. And they fill in the gaps with hopeful, wishful thinking. And the whole world who's not Christian judges Christians for inventing heaven for our peace of mind and hell for a way to control our children. I'll tell you, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't control our children. And heaven does not offer peace of mind when you're still alive. Every day you still have to face the fears that come with being alive. But the thing I see with so many people is how they want to fill in that blank over and over again. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible. I love that word. Inexpressible. And full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The end of your faith. The end of your faith. The salvation of your souls. The end of your faith. Not the beginning. The end. Something about running that race with endurance. I, I, I Forgive me for repeating myself, people who keep hearing me say this, but I'm kind of like in a little box right now. This is the least, the least free-spirited I've ever felt in my entire life these last three months. I, I really do feel like I'm just in a little box and there's hardly any air and it's going to cave in any time and I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. That's pretty much how it feels from sun up to sun down. However, just as I have been for 32 years, I look back and I see what the Lord has done. I do not pray to see the good in what's happened. I don't want good to come out of what's happened. You know, people say, well, you're working on the play. Well, that's really good, and that's good coming out. Oh, no. Maybe if I make, you know, you know, $10 million, go to Broadway and get a Pulitzer, I might say it was kind of good. But as I've said over and over again, when I accept my Pulitzer, I would say thank you for this award. I traded in for my son any day of the week. I don't want good for me to come out of this. That, that, somehow that negates something. And I know 
that's limited thinking on some level, but I, I'm, I'm pretty complicated and I really understand that um, great can come out of tragedy for others and that's good. But do I have to ever call that good? No, that doesn't matter. You know what, my opinion about what God does in me and through me is irrelevant. I praise God for my foundation for giving me a foundation in Him. And I've said this all along. I, I, I can't believe anyone would, be, would still have a relationship with God when his kid dies. I can't believe it. I can't believe anyone just, just doesn't say, screw it. And I've seen people do it. I've, I've preached on this. You know, I have a friend that I ran into and we'd been on a worship team together and I ran into him years later and he says, I'm not a Christian anymore. And I go, why? And he goes, because my daughter got killed in a car accident and and I'm not a Christian anymore. I go, what do you mean you're not a Christian? I, I just stopped. I go, so you still know who Jesus is, right? He goes, yeah. And he, goes, he goes, but I'm done with them. Go, you don't understand. You're, you're, you're just a bad Christian. You're just a bad Christian. You're still a Christian. You know, I'm my dad's son. I can change my name and move to a different city. But I can't change the fact of who my father is. This is a reality. I love telling my son that whenever we fought. I go, you know what? You, can, you can't get away from this. We are one, baby. We are one. Well, you think it's bad when they're alive. And you think it's bad with a parent when they're alive. Well, I've lost one on each end. And let me tell you, the dance gets louder, faster, and scarier when there's only one of you doing the dancing. You have a lot more issues. Work out as many issues with your lover. I tell people that all the time. I tell people that when my mom died. Work it out. Work it out. I'm so glad we worked out some of it because, man, there was a lot. And work it out. If, if you have people that are going to die in your life, man, fly out, sit with them, and make peace. It's a long life afterwards. But for me, all I can see is foundation. I, all I can see is, is that the world is spinning so fast that if I try to look at it, I get nauseous and sick. But I look down at my feet and they're always in the same place. I am not stumbling. I'm not falling. I'm not falling away. I'm not losing ground. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> my health is deteriorating. My relationships are ruined. I've destroyed my career. But everything, every, everything else in my life can go to pot. The only thing that matters is the same as it ever was. Strong as ever. Because when it was good, I planted myself firmly. When it was easy, I studied. When... When I had optimism, I attended church. I did these things when I could because one day I was being told by the Holy Spirit at 19 that one day I'd be in a place where it wouldn't be so easy. Where it wouldn't be so easy. So to sponge up, camel up, as much in me as possible. Well, I'm here. I'm here, and I'm here, and I'm here, and you know, I'm not fine, and I don't want to be fine. I'm different. But I don't hate God. I don't blame God. And everybody knows me knows I'm a blamer. I'm a finger pointer. I'm a finger pointing grudge bearer. And all I see around me is what I've always seen souls who need to make eternal peace before the inevitable happens in case the inevitable comes without any warning. 